प्रणाम जी नमस्कार जय श्री राम वेलकम टू द अखिल भारतीय हिंदू राष्ट्र अधिवेशन हेल्ड बाय हिंदू जन जागृति समिति इट्स माय प्लेजर टू बी एबल टू हैव अ स्लॉट इन टू स्पीक विद यू टुडे टुडे आई एम गोइंग टू बी टॉकिंग अबाउट अ सब्जेक्ट व्हिच इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टू अस एंड स्पेशली लास्ट ईयर हैज बिकम अ प्राइम इंपॉर्टेंस एंड दैट सब्जेक्ट इज द सब्जेक्ट ऑफ हिंदूफोबिया आई एम गोइंग टू ब्रीफली कवर some research that i have done i wanted to find out when did this start we have a belief that every child is born without nafrat in their heart no hatred whatsoever and so at some point in time hatred for hindus must have been created and then seeded and then proliferated and now it's being harvested all over the world in the uk in the western world throughout europe and most recently in america as well so i'm going to share with you some of the results of my research and uh, thank you very much for listening and for joining in so the first thing that i'm going to cover is to do with hindophobia and its source now most of us know that hindophobia is a relatively recent term but it's being applied now more and more especially as we hindus become widely settled we are established in many countries in many communities and in many fields of endeavor the hindu community is becoming successful and being acknowledged as successful we have established hindu communities now in the united kingdom we have many communities all over the united states and it is a, a common thing that uh, the hindu community is present in pretty much every country now so as we become more and more established the question arises why is it that we're not receiving respect friendship appreciation and instead of those things which we have a right and should really naturally be receiving we're seeing an explosion of hindu phobia in the west we're going to explore what that is hindu phobia we have seen over the last year in the united kingdom and in the us recently we had the case of rashmi samanthi at oxford university where she was discriminated against purely for being a hindu rutgers university in the united states similar experience for the hindu children there uh, audrey trushke has been at the center of fermenting this criticism and uh, unfair treatment of hindu children california state university we saw very recently the false attempts to ascribe caste discrimination to our community without evidence and on the basis of hearsay most universities um rajiv malhotra ji has spoken in the academic sphere and many of the universities oxford and um most american universities have not given him the respect that his research and his contribution naturally should uh, expect and very recently as recently as last week vivek agnihotri ji who was here in the united kingdom uh, promoting and spreading the message of the kashmir files the story of terrorism directed at hindus because they were hindus in the kashmir valley and in jammu as well and we had arranged for him to speak at oxford university at the union which has welcomed many many people um some of them with quite extraordinary views and ideologies and um including some south african presidents uh, uh supporters of apartheid etc and yet vivek ji was within only i think a mu- few hours notice Uh, cancelled and then at cambridge he was denied the opportunity to record the talk that he was giving purely and solely because of complaints from a very small number of students and all of these have one thing in common and that thing in column in common is hindu phobia the hatred of hindus being directed at us when there is absolutely no justification for it that's outside of bharat inside of bharat we know now that when the british left they left an institutionalized state which was anti-hindu it discriminated against hindus as a matter of law there is a wonderful hindu charter at uh, equalrightsforhindus.com which captures the major points in institutional hindu phobia against hindus in bharat we know that the the, the the constitution itself the constitution is an anti-hindu colonialist construct there are many people who worship it but it's merely the work of fallible human beings and it is something that should be revisited now that the world has a clear idea of universal human rights but we have hindu phobia established in bharat against hindus the indigenous population of that land 
Now this Hindu phobia causes a great deal of harm for many, many people. Um, if you think about what, uh, what it does for community cohesion, hatred, seeded, always results in friction between communities. It creates friction and discord, not just between communities and groups, but also across generations. I know that Hindu phobia is causing a great deal of discomfort to our children, and many of them who do not know what the roots and the source of this is, they tend to try and become more comfortable by becoming more distant from their roots, and that's an entirely unacceptable and unfortunate um, outcome. And then naturally there's the global injustice against Hindus. We have seen how a completely spurious accusation against somebody as prominent and protected as Nupur Sharma has been trumpeted around the world. We saw those ridiculous remarks of cow worshippers, urine drinkers, and more unpleasant remarks being targeted. And that was exactly what Hindu phobia actually does and it causes. So we're going to have a look at uh, many of these, but really my question, the central question of my theme was, why does this happen? And why are we seeing this explosion of Hindu phobia now? And why is it in so many corners of the world? How can we deal with such hatred unless we know what form it takes and the source of this hatred? And then when we know this, hopefully we can put a plan together. Without a plan, there is no, no, no chance of defeating this. Um, Warren Buffet, um, the famous quotation, an idiot with a plan can defeat a genius without a plan. So we need to formulate a plan because Hindu phobia is not going away. And it's becoming apparent that there are vested interests who don't want it to go away. And we'll look at some of those in a few moments as well. So who created this hatred of Hindus? When did it start? And why was this done? These were the central questions in my mind. And these are the results of my research. When was it done? The first record I've been able to find of Hindu phobia, hatred of Hindus, is 1813. And I'd be grateful if you could remember that 1813 was the year when the East India Company had been in place for over 200 years. In that period, it had extracted huge, vast fortunes, and England had a, a ruling class who were, shall we say, they had so much wealth that they had to create offshore havens to conceal it. Obscene levels of wealth, especially when you consider that it was the fruits of rape, pillage, theft, and asset stripping from India. Up until 1813, the Church of England had no authority or permission to go to India, and they felt excluded. They desperately wanted to get their um, missionary activity in India. They wanted evangelism to start in India. And they tried to find ways in which they could make it happen. They tried several times to get the charter of the, the East India Company changed to allow them to visit India and to start their um, the evangelical uh, missions and to become established there. But they failed repeatedly. The East India Company was quite conscious that they didn't want to disrupt the, um, shall we say, the way in which the Hindu community was functioning. They were very happy to have the Hindus working away and have the British taking the assets out. They did not want to disrupt their slave force. And that's pretty much what it was. So the East India Company resisted all of the efforts of Wil William Wilberforce at that point in time. Lord Liverpool said in the House of uh, Lords, community discord is bad for business. And so the Church of England was initially denied access. But it needed and wanted access. It was not going to allow such an incredible source of wealth to perhaps uh, be, uh, be kept away from it. And so it, it, uh, it ramped up its pressure. It started to work out a strategy. And by March of 1813, Parliament was being lobbied by the Church. It was being lobbied by representatives within Parliament, members of the Church who were very much attached to the idea that the Church should spread its wings uh, into India, but not particularly successfully. And so in order to create more pressure on the Parliament, uh, a movement started. And what this movement was, was actually a grassroots movement. The various evangelical missions, all of whom were excluded, they started to coordinate their um, uh, impact. They started to press upon the parliamentarians that they, there was a natural mission for them to civilize the heathen. But it was all pretty much resisted right the way through to March 1813. And then, 
it came became probably one of the most prominent subjects of conversation in Parliament in that year. Many people who had been to India, who knew what uh, the Hindus were like, Lord Hastings was a, an example, he said, the Hindus are gentle, benevolent, more susceptible of gratitude for kindness shown to them, and as exempt from the worst propensities of human passion as any people on the face of the earth. So this is a civilization which he appreciated that the members of this civilization were gentle, they were civilized. And so whatever society existed at that time, it created people who were living together in the most civilized of manners, and the Christian Church of England and the British East India Company were fully aware of this. So there, there were a few attempts to try and impress upon parliamentarians that there should be a religious dimension to it, and they weren't particularly successful. And so Wellesley, Lord Wellesley, came up with a scheme. And he was aware that if religion was pushed, the Hindu will reject it. And so his idea was, let's merge religion with education, which Hindus love. And that was the first genesis of, an, of a deceitful um, program being created and sculpted. But even then, at the end of March, there was no progress and the evangelicals were beginning to despair. But something else happened then. What they started to do was to actually start to approach the people of the country. They started to lobby the British population to allow the church to continue its mission into India, even though the East India Company had rejected it, and even though the parliamentarians had said, we don't want this to happen, it will disturb a source of incredible revenue and wealth. 22nd of June, a few months after March, when the first resolution was attempted in the House of Lords, Lord Montgomery then said, The moral character of the Hindu is a great deal better than that of the people of this country, who at present only gave an example of lying, swearing, drunkenness and other vices. This was at the beginning of the debate. William Wilberforce stood up to speak, and William Wilberforce spoke for an extraordinarily long time, and in it, in his talk, what he did was to start to seed the direct hatred and contempt for Hindus. He spoke for over an hour and a half, I believe it was. And in that time, he started to preach the mantra of how terrible the Hindus were. He started to speak about the depraved conditions of the Hindus. And a, a rhetoric was being constructed that the Hindus were in such dire straits because of their diabolical and demonic religion that they had to be saved. The white saviour mentality was carefully being sculpted and the brown, heathen, pagan, vile, subhuman Hindu was also being sculpted. By the end of that month, 12th of April 1813, on that date, over 908 petitions had been presented to Parliament by the Christian population of the United Kingdom asking parliamentarians to allow the church to save the Hindu. This was the highest number of petitions ever presented, and it was only possible because from every pulpit, from every schoolmaster's desk, the mantra had gone out that the Hindus were evil, that they were guilty of sati, that polygamy was uh, rife, that infanticide was uh, a fundamental part of the Hindu religion, and that idolatry was the grand abomination of the people of that country, who at present only give an example of lying, swearing, drunkenness and other vices. The clause protecting the Indian right to freedom of religion was passed. So make a, a note. First we have the elevation of the Christian mission to civilise. Then we have the denigration of the Hindu. And then we introduce the third aspect, which is, it's our job to save them. And to protect their freedoms, we will introduce legislation to give freedom of religion. Now, what freedom of religion really meant was freedom for the church to enter and to start proselytizing and evangelizing, to start acquiring property, to start seeding churches without constraint. And this was what William Wilberforce achieved. It wasn't just in India that the seeding of hatred for Hindus was undertaken with such ruthlessness and precision. The same hatred for Hindus, for the children of India, then transferred itself with the Christian missionaries to the United States. 
Remember, the United States is on the other side of the world, diametrically opposite to where India is. And yet, it became a common statement to say, kill the Indian, save the man. And the campaigns were all using the rhetoric of hatred for Hindus, hatred for Indians, which had been seeded and so successfully harvested in India. Now it was seeded and began to be harvested in the United States. You may have heard of the terrible crimes of the Anglican churches in Canada, across Canada and across America, where they would kidnap children, often at gunpoint from their parents, and put them into what were essentially juvenile concentration camps, where they were beaten if they spoke their own language, their names were changed, their hair were cut, they were Christianized, they were Anglicized, they were Westernized. And the attempt was exactly the same as it was in India, which was cultural genocide or ethnocide, the erasure of the indigenous identity with the tag of Indian and Hindu attached to it. So the evidence that I've presented, it confirms that global anti-Hindu sentiment was spawned by the churches. It was started by the British Church of England and the other, the Church of Scotland was also uh, engaged in this and the other religious institutions. And it was started and spearheaded by William Wilberforce in 1813. And um, it may be worth noting that he is the person accredited with um, stopping slavery. Um, but that uh, also should be scrutinised, that reputation should be scrutinised a little bit more. In that time, those petitions that were being raised, 908 of them, over half a million, 500,000 British Christians signed those petitions. And they signed them because they were deliberately and willfully misled by the evangelicals in the churches and in the schools. So this is how the national consciousness of the United Kingdom was seeded with hatred for Indians at that time. And it has never been reversed. It has never been reset. It has never been um, rectified. And so even to this day, there is this deep-seated subconscious um, bias, a hatred for Hindus. And the moment that a Hindu starts to step forward and assert some rights, it's remarkable how quickly those colonialist tropes and those seeds of hatred start to bear fruit and hatred manifests itself too easily. All three aspects are present even today. The church suddenly starts to feel that it has a saviour mentality and it has to save the Hindu who has a savage mentality and it has to be done as a favour to the Hindu. And all of this, I'm suggesting, according to the evidence, was born in the United Kingdom. And this is why the Western nations have this uh, unpleasant um, proclivity to suddenly become anti-Hindu at the drop of a hat. So even in the 21st century, we now have global Hindu phobia throughout the Western Euro-Christian world. I'm hoping now that you know why this happened, when it was seeded, and who was behind it. Now that we know this, we have an opportunity to start to reflect on what needs to be done to reverse this and for justice to be done. But the question that I'd like to leave you with is what are we going to do about it? It's up to us to now address this. It's up to us to find the vocabulary and to challenge the institutions and demand that they acknowledge that this is what they did. The evidence is irrefutable and I'm more than happy to share it with anybody who wishes to inquire further. But if we are going to have a Hindu Rashtra, the re-emergence of the oldest dharmic continuous civilization on the planet, the civilization which elevated humanity to a direct connection with divinity, the civilization which gave humanity yoga bhyas, yoga vidya, mathematics, ayurved, medicine, and so much else in terms of knowledge and wealth, the civilization that people used to walk for many months and years to find so that they could find themselves, so they could sit at the feet of learned people. The civilization that gave $45 trillion worth of its wealth to Britain and which then triggered the British Industrial Revolution and civilized this island and brought it out of poverty. The same civilization that fueled the re-emergence of the Dutch and the Dutch East India Company, the same civilization 
which fed Portugal and was responsible for the renaissance of Portuguese civilization. That same civilization, the members of that civilization, are the ones for whom Hinduphobia has been seeded across the planet. And I think we now really need to start to engage with the source of our hurt and the source of our harm and to start to inquire from them what they are going to do to help us repair this. The institutions which inflicted this hatred on us are still present and they are the ones that are responsible. By and large, the average population in the United Kingdom, in Holland, in Portugal, in France, they are not aware of what was done by their governments and their institutions and their religious institutions and they need to know. My suggestion is the first thing we should start to do is to engage with the various government bodies of those nations and advise them that this is what was done. We know it's what was done and we really would like them to engage with us to see what needs to be done so that we can all move forward. It's worth remembering that the consequences of this hatred can be measured in tens of millions of lives lost to the Hindu civilization, many, many times more than the lives lost by, uh, according to, by the violence that was inflicted by the Nazis, many, many times more, and yet we still have not had an adequate process of reconciliation. My suggestion is that's what we seek. Thank you so much for bearing with me and for listening to my little presentation. If you have any questions, I can be contacted by my website, that's satishkesharma.com, or by Twitter, I'm at the British Hindu. And in uh, conclusion, I'd just like to give my deepest regards to the Hindu Janjaguti Samiti for holding this incredible event, and I look forward to participating again in the future. Thank you very much. Jai Shri Dhan. Namaste. We hope you enjoyed this Chitti Media content. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanyavad. Namaskar.